Okay, this is uh, section 15.2. Uh, it's about aqueous solutions. Solutions where stuff is dissolved in water. And if you're not part of the solution, uh, you must be a precipitate. <laughs> so there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of uh, new vocabulary we're going to have in this unit. Um, the different um, measures of concentration and starting off today with some important vocabulary solvent and solute concentrated dilute saturated and unsaturated those are things you need to be very clear that you can not only define them but distinguish them from each other um, so a solution is a homogeneous mixture that means all of the substances that are in the solution and there has to be at least two different substances for it to be a solution. They are mixed completely uh, all the way down to a molecule by molecule level so that it is a, uh, a homogeneous mixture. A sample taken anywhere from a solution should be the same as a sample from any other spot in the solution. The solvent is for us usually going to be water. That is the stuff that is the dissolving medium and then the solute is the stuff that is dissolved into the solvent. So very often for us that's going to mean an ionic compound um, dissolved in water makes up our solution. Um, aqueous solutions are those solutions where the solvent is water and uh, typically it is some ionic compound or sometimes a molecular compound that's dissolved into the water as the solute. Um, particle size has to be very small for it to be considered a solution because if the particle sizes are too big then they'll tend to settle out of solution. They'll fall down to the bottom of the beaker because of gravity and then well then we don't have a solution anymore. Um, another a little bit to show you the difference between solute and solvent. Um, the solute particles could be like all of the ionic compounds, the salts of various kinds that are dissolved in seawater, the sugar that we dissolve in a soda, or the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in a soda. And then the solvent in all of those cases would be water. Um, the air that we breathe is also a solution. It's a homogeneous mixture of different gases. And what you call the solute and what you call the solvent is sometimes quite arbitrary. And the air... <laughs> Listen to the music. Oh, good. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh boy. I'm going to continue as if you can hear me over the music. This... <laughs> The solute or the solvent in a solution like the air is arbitrary. So there's nitrogen and oxygen mainly in the air and lots of other trace gases. And what we call the solvent in that case is completely up to us. Now, nitrogen would make sense because it's the component in the highest concentration in air but it doesn't have to be nitrogen. We could make the solvent anything. But uh, when we're dealing with water uh, and stuff dissolved in water, water will always be the solvent. Um, I just mentioned a, an example of a non-aqueous solution. We'll get kind of stuck on aqueous solutions because that's what we deal with most in an introductory chemistry class. But lots of other solutions exist in various states. Um, air is one example of a homogeneous mixture for 18 karat gold. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lady Gaga is very distracting. <laughs> 18 karat gold is another solution. It's a solid, but it's a homogeneous mixture of different substances. In the case of 18 karat gold, it's 75% gold with a differing composition of silver and copper depending on what color we want our 18 karat gold to be more pale colored 
more silver, more yellow colored, more copper would be added. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of solutions out there. This looks like a picture from a hardware store. Um, but you could also walk down uh, the aisle of a drugstore and you would find similar racks of solutions and even in a grocery store lots and lots of solutions. Uh, that's not supposed to be there anymore because I made these new ones. <laughs> uh, so the next thing we're going to distinguish between concentrated and dilute, saturated versus unsaturated and I'll show you the animations the interactive uh, animations that these pictures come from. Um, this is showing a very small tank of water. You can see the volume over here is a very scant 7 times 10 to the negative 23 liters. A very, very small volume of water. And we see sodium and chloride ions dissolved in the solution. They came from this here salt shaker up here. <laughs> so the sodium and chloride is swimming around in the solution. Thank you. Lauren, go to the high school office. Um, so we have all of these ions swimming around in the water. And this is a quite concentrated solution because sodium chloride is very soluble. We can put or dissolve a lot of sodium chloride in water because of the nature of the sodium chloride and its relationship with water molecules. So even though there's lots and lots of sodium chloride in this solution and therefore we would call it concentrated, the solution is not saturated. Saturated solution is one that is holding all of the dissolved substance that it possibly can for a particular substance. And since sodium chloride is very, very soluble, we would have to add quite a bit more sodium chloride into this sample of water to reach the saturation point where the next crystal of sodium chloride we would drop in, no more could dissolve. And we'll see what that looks like in the next slide where we look at a very slightly soluble compound thallium-1 sulfide, TH2S. Thallium-1 sulfide is very insoluble. Only a tiny amount will dissolve in water. And if we look at the amount of water in our tank here, we're about 1.3 times 10 to the negative 16 liters. It's still very small, but this is like a million times more water than in the previous uh, picture and yet we have many 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 fewer ions dissolved and we have this chunk of solid sal <coughs> thallium sulfide at the bottom so only a handful of the ions have broken off and the solution is saturated nonetheless this solution is holding all of the thallium sulfide dissolved that it can possibly hold but because we only have a few ions dissolved, we would also call this solution dilute. So a concentrated solution, as we saw with the sodium chloride, is not always saturated. And a saturated solution is not always concentrated if it's relatively insoluble, like our thallium-1 sulfide. OK, some rules that we'll talk about, and this will come up uh, I, th I would say quite a few times in this unit. A good general rule to remember about stuff dissolving into a particular solvent is like dissolves like. Similar things tend to dissolve in uh, uh, a solute, uh, excuse me, in a solvent. So if the solute substance has similar chemical properties to the solvent, it's more likely to dissolve. So since we use water, which is very polar, as our solvent most of the time, we find that lots of polar compounds will dissolve in water. And if it's a nonpolar compound, like an oil or a wax, that wouldn't tend to dissolve in water, and that's exactly what we observe. Um, ionic compounds, salts, are made up of charged particles, positive and negative ions, right? Well, we know that water has 
a positive and a negative side because it's a very polar molecule. And so those charged particles in the ionic compounds would also tend to be attracted to the water molecules. And that is the reason why most ionic compounds do dissolve in water. The solution process. Wow. This is, this is one of those videos. The solution process is called, it's called solvation. And during solvation, two things have to happen. The water molecules will, because of their attractions for the ions, get into the cracks between the crystal, uh, the, the positive and negative ions in the crystal of the solid ionic compound. And they will break some of those bonds, the ionic bonds, between the positive and negative charges. And once they have a positive or negative ion broken off of the crystal, water molecules would then tend to surround them because the positive sides of the water molecules, the hydrogens, would tend to attract strongly to negative ions. And the negative sides of water molecules, the oxygens, would tend to attract and surround positively charged ions. And the bottom line, ultimately, to determine whether an ionic compound will dissolve in water is the, gr the strength of the attraction between the ions in the compound versus the strength of the attractions between the water molecules and the ions in the compound. And some compounds, like the thallium sulfide that we just looked at in the picture, have really strong ion-ion bonds and so the water molecules have a really tough time breaking off any of those ions. Same thing is true for other compounds that we call insoluble, barium sulfate, calcium carbonate. Now, it's true that a few ions will break off of those crystals, but we call them insoluble because it's such a small amount that you, know, you drop a chunk of barium sulfate into a beaker of water, and to our eyes it looks like none of it will dissolve even though a few ions do break off. Um, I'm going to show you this video in class, so I'm going to skip that for now. But if you want to get the PowerPoint presentation and click on that, oh no, you won't see it. Oh, so I should show it. Let's see if it pops up like it's supposed to. Yeah, this is going to be one of those videos. <laughs> Oh, look at there. There it goes. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll let this run real quick, um, even though I'll probably show it in class, just because it's here. Watch how the water molecules interact with the sodium and chloride ions in the crystal. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the latter. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules cluster about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ions. On the other hand, water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. So here's what I was just talking about. We have these solvated ions, and that's what they're called when they're broken off the crystal and they're in solution. And they get surrounded by water molecules, and that prevents them very easily from going back and joining the crystal. Because obviously, they're still positive and negative charges, and they would tend to be attracted to one another. But the water molecules kind of block them from sticking back together with other opposite charged ions. And in the negative chloride ions, the hydrogens are all facing the negative charge of the chloride. And in the positive sodium ion over here, the negative, relatively negative oxygen parts of the water molecules are facing the positive charge of the ion. So that's what the solution process looks like. And that's one of your essay questions on your preview that may show up on your test as well. And I just talked about this in the previous slide, so you can pause this if you would like to and read back through this, but I'm going to try to shorten this video after our, our multiple interruptions, so 
Uh, I've said some, most of this already, and you can read it on your own. Next big topic here is uh, to define what are electrolytes and non-electrolytes. And we'll do a demonstration of this in class. And uh, the bottom line is that an electrolyte is something that can conduct electricity, either when it's dissolved in water or if it is melted. And that's a, a new term, perhaps, for some of you, the molten state. Um, if something is typically a solid, like an ionic compound, and we heat it up to the point where it, where it melts and it's now a liquid, we would call it molten. That's like they call lava, molten lava, melted rock, yeah? Uh, we don't call it liquid rock. <laughs> well, we do, we could, but because that's what it is, but the uh, term is specifically to identify um, something that is normally experienced in a solid state, but now it's liquid. So an electrolyte can conduct electricity. Two things must be true for an electric current to be conducted. There must be charged particles, and those particles must be able to move. Well, ionic compounds are all made up of charged particles. But if it's in the solid form, those particles can't move. They're locked in the crystals. But if we dissolve those ions in solution, they're moving around, bouncing around in the aqueous solution in the water. And so then they could conduct electricity. And the same would be true if we melted those ionic compounds. Now they're in the liquid state, and the particles can move. Um, so insoluble ionic compounds like our thallium sulfide and the calcium carbonate that we talked about before, those are electrolytes, but only when they're molten, right? Because they do not dissolve enough in water to conduct an electric current. Things that are not electrolytes are things that do not carry a charge and therefore can't conduct an electric current current. So molecules, molecular compounds, they are non-electrolytes. And then anything that doesn't dissolve at all in water would be a non-electrolyte as long as it's in a solid form. And then there are things that are called weak electrolytes versus strong electrolytes. If it's a weak electrolyte, maybe it would produce a few ions in a solution and a strong electrolyte produces a lot of ions and can conduct an electric current strongly. And we'll talk more about that when we cover acids and bases in a future unit because we'll talk about weak and strong acids and it ties right in with the weak and strong electrolytes. But for now, most ionic compounds, if it's soluble, it's a strong electrolyte. And if it's insoluble, it's still electrolyte. It's still an electrolyte but only if it's melted, only if it's liquefied. And here's showing a, an example of what we're going to see in class with a non-electrolyte, a strong electrolyte, and a weak electrolyte. And you can pause and take a look at this, um, but again, we'll talk about this in class too. So another thing here about strong and weak electrolytes, but I think I've covered more or less what I want to cover here. But pause this and take a look at these notes if you need to. Wow, I think, I, I think I've said enough about electrolytes. I'm going to have to take out some of these slides. Hmm, yes. Hmm, correct. Will it ever end with the electrolytes? Hmm, I see. <laughs> it's the, the one point here with the non-electrolytes, substances that are molecular, like methanol, they dissolve very well in water. Some molecular substances do. So you can have tons of stuff dissolved in the water, but they are not charged particles, and so they don't conduct electricity, which explains why water doesn't conduct electricity, uh, despite what you may have thought before. Pure water is a terrible conductor of electricity. All right, and the final thing is 
about hydrated ionic compounds. And this has come up because we've used hydrates in a couple of labs. A hydrated ionic compound is an ionic compound that draws water molecules into its crystal structure. And so the formula for the ionic compound is the ions themselves, like copper sulfate, plus the water molecules that embed themselves into the crystal of the ionic compound. And the most common form of copper sulfate is the pentahydrate. That means for each unit of copper sulfate, for each one copper and one sulfate ion, five water molecules will squeeze in between the cracks of those ions in the crystal. And so the weight of the compound is not just the ionic part of the compound. Those water molecules that are in there would also add to the weight of the compound. And we have to take those into account when we're measuring out samples of hydrated compound. Um, this water of hydration, as it is called, can be driven off by relatively gentle heating. We warm it up, and the water molecules get enough kinetic energy that they break the relatively weak attractions that they have for the ions in the crystal, and they can be driven off. It's not exactly like they're being boiled off, but kind of. The ionic compound after all the water is driven off is called the anhydrous version of the ionic compound, or the anhydride, which just means without water. And anhydrous compounds or hydrated compounds that still have the potential to attract more water molecules are called hygroscopic compounds if they tend to pull water right out of the air. And those types of compounds are used in things like these little desiccation packs that you always find packaged in uh, new electronics and things like that to keep the water out of the electronics while they're being shipped. Um, lots and lots of stuff like that is shipped by sea, and the very moist, salty air would do damage to some of those electronic components if the uh, packaging inside didn't keep things nice and dry. And that's why they put those things in there to pull water molecules out of the air and keep the air dry around the electronics. And finally, uh, one of the calculations that you're going to have to do, one of the first kinds of calculations you'll have to do for this unit is to calculate the percent water in a hydrate. And the way to do that is described in the diagram on the slide here. And they show you how to do the calculation for sodium carbonate decahydrate. And the percent of anything is the part divided by the whole times 100 to make it a percent. So it's the mass of the water divided by the mass of the whole that it came from. And that means the entire hydrate. So the mass of the water divided by the whole mass of the compound, the water plus the anhydrous ion and ionic compound. And then times 100 to give you the correct percentage. So this is just about using the periodic table to look up the masses, get the correct mass for the amount of water, divide by the total mass of the whole hydrated compound, times 100 to give you the percent water. Do that real quick, if you would, as a practice with number 6 there to calculate the percent water in copper sulfate pentahydrate. And that's enough.